going to send an email. And we're going to look at that email. And so we get this published, you know, Java app from Google. We're going to run it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Call us a back shot. That's not even mad to do. Seriously. <laughs> so we run it. Now, one thing to notice, what happened? Anybody notice what happened? Google. We're at Google. So when the payload executed, it redirected us back to the legitimate Google site. So the user actually never saw that he was anywhere else other than Google. Now, if I'm like, oh, hey, my Google, cool. I'm going to go in and I'm going to type some stuff and use it. It's all good. So, you, you know, the browser is Google normally. Everything's good. However, on our attacker machine, we got an interpreter account, so we fully compromised that machine. So, if it ever worked. Is there any way to use the uh, Google API calls so when it redirects to the Google site, you can actually, like when they put in their login, it will automatically already log in? Log in. Do you need like an API key or anything? Not necessarily. What, what you can do is when you harvest the actual credentials itself, you can refresh a post from the user account to the original site. That's just a pain. And when I was writing the credential harvester and, and I started actually programming that, it was a real big pain. So it only worked on certain sites. If they had chosen the uh, stay logged in feature, yeah. After they submit the password, but the very next thing they see automatically be Google because they already had the Yes. The okay. Yes. So if they're already logged in, it would obviously do it. Obviously, you know, this is just an example using Google, but you definitely don't want to use it from a, a Google perspective. Um, you use this when you're trying to go after your organization, right? So that was that. Next is the in the in the website tag vector, you also got the um, site cloning, and we're going to go ahead and use the Metasploit browser exploit method. Um, that one you takes Metasploit exploits, um, and, and we didn't really cover them too well, so let's let's really go go really fast into that. So browser-based exploits, if you're not familiar with them, as soon as you go to a browser website, it triggers a vulnerability within your specific browser and then causes a, what we call generally a heap overflow, a heap-based overflow. Um, a lot of times what we saw with, with what Elliot was talking about was a stack base, right? So with a heap, it's a little bit different. Heap is dynamic memory. It's al dynamic allocated memory. So what ends up happening is a heap will grow or shrink based off of its requirements, what it needs in order for it to use. It's just kind of like garbage data, stuff that stores in the heap in order to use it. With browser overflows or exploits, um, what ends up happening, and this is a pretty cool method, uh, a guy named Skyline came up with it, I think in like 2002 or 2003 or something like that, and he worked for Microsoft. Nah, I taught him how to play crabs and bakes, which is kind of cool. Um, but uh, what, with, with heap-based overflows, what ends up happening is, you think about it, there's just a, gar a garbage amount of data. The memory addresses are completely random. You have no idea where you're at in the heap. It's going to be different every single time. Um, it's just that kind of space that's used for the application or you know information that you're entering, right? So what you can do with, with client-side exploits is it grows the heap. So say, for example, you have 4 gigs of RAM. It'll continuously grow the heap until you hit that 4 gigs of RAM. So if you look at when a browser exploit is actually firing off and you look at your task manager, you'll see your RAM utilization go all the way up to max. And what's happening is it's filling your heap with knobs and filling your, your heap with shell code. So what ends up happening is you blindly fire into the heap. You don't know where you're going. You're going somewhere in the heap. You fire into the heap, you have about a 92% chance of hitting your knobs, and then mm, down your shell code, next to your shell code, and boom, you have access to the system. And you also bypass that ASLR, stack counter protection, all of the preventive measures that are in place generally, right? Um, so heap-based exploits are a much more reliable method from you know exploiting browsers than any type of stack overflow would be. Um, so what's cool about that though is it generally has anywhere between like an 87% and 92% success rate. Reason being is what happens if you jump halfway into your shell code or halfway into some other garbage data that's left over from the application, um, it'll crash. So you'll see Internet Explorer actually crash sometimes. It's just a, a kind of FYI on, on heap-based exploits. But Metasploit has a ton of browser exploits based within it. A lot of them are for Internet Explorer. Um, but you go through and you can see a bunch of different types of browser exploits. Now let's search for the Aurora one because that's always the most popular, right? So to use one, you should use the same as a, every other exploit. Now we're going to set our payload as a bind. We can do reverse if we want to. But. And as 
generally use um, 443 or 80 because it's generally a loud outbound. Now, does anybody here do strict egress filtering on their network? You know, i.e., I don't allow very many ports from my clients, my customer base, or my you know, my users going outbound to the internet. Right? We've got a few. Do we allow any ports at all for those users to be able to connect up? Yeah. We can. We have to. I mean, that's just. So Microsoft are um, so Microsoft. Um, so Metasploit came out with this thing called all ports, which is a pretty slick method. And what the all port payload does is it actually tries connecting up every single port going outbound. So from 1 to 65,000, whatever. So if you have egress filtering and you allow one port out, it's going to find it, and it's going to allow it out. Does it do it uh, incrementally, or does it do it random? It's random, I believe. I'm not sure offhand. I can't remember. There, when, you, when you blog posted about it, I'm pretty sure you said it was random. But it takes a very long time. So you know it could take you know 10 minutes, because it you know fires off 65,000 some of ports. So if you're not monitoring, if you're monitoring your egress, and probably you know probably notice uh, 65,000 different attacks. But um, you never know. But uh, it's very good for that. Second off, a lot of people say, well, hey, we know we filter, you know, HTTP, we inspect, you know, HTTP and HTTPS traffic, you know, making sure that it's legitimate HTTP traffic, right? So Metasploit released a HTTP-based uh, payload. So we have somewhere. We have HTTP and HTTPS based payloads. So the actual consoles will fully function over an HTTP based connection. So if you're inspecting HTTP traffic, you're inspecting HTTPS traffic, i.e. do SSL termination, um, it will let you basically still go by that, which is awesome. So we're just going to do a normal payload. And our, our, we don't have an R host in this specific example. If you look here, what Metasploit will do is it will create its own HTTP server on port 8080 and with a URI path of something random. So the, what I generally do is obviously set my server port to 80 because I don't know how I'm going to get somebody to connect me on 8080. Okay. Um, or you can set URI path to, and, uh, and also set the URI path to root. So what's going to happen is it's going to set up a web server. As soon as someone connects to me, um, it will basically go ahead and execute that. Now, if you're going through and you're doing these types of attacks, I'll show you set does it automatically for you. But I mean, you can, all, you can always just inject an iframe into a site you compromise or something like that. So if you're going and you're hacking your company, and you you know compromise a website, you inject an iframe into there. Every single time someone goes, and I only recommend doing this in the internal. Obviously, you don't want customers getting hacked. Um, but every time someone goes to visit that site, that iframe will load and it automatically points a Metasploit and start exploiting the system for you automatically without them ever knowing about it. So you exploit it, and we're running a specific HTTP server. We'll go ahead and run it. And a person gets this little box here, but there's nothing really you know, exciting going on, right? However, on the other side, we got an interpreter council. Potentially. Yeah, it should be a little slow. But we were able to center stage, and eventually the interpreter council would come up. Any questions on browser exploits? I managed to get my browser to, to do the actual exploit. What do you mean? Like, do you get a interpreter console? No, it, it said it connected, but it didn't do anything after that, like the other. Is it, did it say exploit completed, but not? Or did you actually get the interpreter console? It said that, um, what do you say? Session one so then, okay, so if you get the session one open, what ends up happening is you're running it in the background. So if you do sessions dash L, you won't see anything there. You see that session active? You do sessions, dash I, and the number of that specific session. That'll interact you with that specific session. Cool. So now you have a tour accounts. Any questions? Is there at least one exploit for each browser? Yes. Uh, well, I just have, in my, generally, yes, there's Firefox and Met Metasploit. There's, I believe, there's Safari, there's Opera. Um, so yes, there are exploits pretty much for, for every single browser out there. Obviously, more there's more for Internet Explorer uh, than there is for Firefox or Opera or Safari. Um, but the majority of them, you know, I mean, they're they're pretty much the, the old 
The most latest Firefox one is for 3.5. 